So in 2009, uh, there was an influx of uh, traumatic brain injury um, in the VA, and I was voluntold by uh, Dr. Sifu and uh, the folks in uh, Washington, D.C. to give a talk about what New Jersey was doing uh, in terms of managing this population. Uh, and this presentation was given on June 22nd, 2010. Uh, at the Polytrauma Comorbidities Conference in Orlando, Florida. So uh, here it is. My name is Gautam Malhotra. I'm a full-time physician practicing in the Veterans Administration New Jersey Healthcare System, which includes the Lions and East Orange campuses. I am board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation, neuromuscular medicine, and electrodiagnostic medicine. I am neither an expert in the management of polytrauma veterans, nor do I have specific training in mild traumatic brain injury. The VA New Jersey Healthcare System is a group of excellent clinicians who are highly motivated to continually improve the care of our veteran population. I am serving as a cheerleader for what we do. So presentation background. The central office recommended that we share what we went through uh, as our growing pains in developing our approach to the challenges faced with this population. The goals are to shift the focus from pathology to community reintegration. This presentation is a narrative of our thoughts and process. We hope that it will serve to validate the feelings, experiences, frustrations, and successes of clinicians in other polytrauma support clinic teams, PSCTs. It may also serve as a model for those who are still in the infancy of developing their own programs. So join me on a right-brained narrative that may feel more like a warm hug than a traditional lecture. Prior to Operation Enduring Freedom, Operation Iraqi Freedom, VA and New Jersey Healthcare System, PMNRS provided quality bread and butter PMNR services to the New Jersey veteran population. Recently, however, many demographic changes occurred over the past decade requiring our department to begin evolving. For example, the overall population is living longer. People with disabilities are also living longer. This essentially increases the overall demand for physical medicine and rehab services. Additionally, the OEF OIF veteran population brings in more young veterans and more female veterans than prior conflicts. In the words of my chief of physical medicine and rehab, Dr. Che M, these days, when I see a family seated in the waiting room, it's not easy to determine which is the veteran. It could be the elderly man, the young man, or the woman, or even all of them. With these demographic changes come obvious changes in their needs and demand of care. Rather than providing pain relief and compensating for mobility deficits, we're now providing sports medicine and occupation-specific rehabilitation. It is a very exciting transition. Although these are exciting changes, they bring enormous challenges with them as well. In New Jersey, uh, we are the face of musculoskeletal care and are steadily providing more interventional pr procedures. We've seen a steady increase in the number of veterans in PMNR consultations over the past decade. The increasing demands required us to become more efficient in our delivery of care. Previously, a physiatrist had to evaluate every inpatient that needed therapy. Due to the shorter length of inpatient stays and the increased outpatient demands, we adopted a direct to therapy model for inpatient physical and occupational therapy. We also worked to add more services during evenings and weekends. Our eventual and perhaps ambitious goal is to be able to virtually provide open access to our population. And this data uh, for this graph was taken from the New Jersey CPRS team. Polytrauma is another reason for us to evolve. In addition uh, to the prior list, polytrauma basically refers to a life-threatening situation resulting in injuries to multiple body systems or body regions and eventually long-term impairments and disabilities. When talking about polytrauma, these are the images that represented our picture of what a polytrauma patient would look like. Rehabilitation of veterans with amputations are quite satisfying and relatively straightforward to manage for a well-trained physiatrist. These are the veterans we see and hear about on TV at Walter Reed and other military hospitals. However, our returning polytrauma veteran population did, didn't end up exactly looking like this. They had very different issues. When we heard that TBI was the uh, signature wound, we were pre pre preparing for what we pictured to be the typical moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. Other than the days during the academic training, we were really not seeing TBI very often. If we ever saw a veteran with TBI, 
it was either someone with a very remote history of it or very different etiology than blast injuries. Over the years, mental health issues have clearly been a component in the functional issues of our prior veteran populations. However, the returning OEF, OIF veterans seem to be coming back with a very serious constellation of PTSD, anxiety spectrum disorders, and substance abuse. Between the TBI and mental health issues, the clinical presentation of these veterans was quite complicated, but in a new way. The brain injuries we were documenting were of the mild category. To review the relevant information, I share a quotation taken from the Institute of Medicine Evidence-Based Practice Guideline. It is estimated that of the total reported TBIs, the vast majority, 75 to 90 percent of these, fit the categorization of mild traumatic brain injury and that approximately 90 percent of these follow a predictable course and experience few, if any, ongoing symptoms and do not require any special medical treatment. The incidence of TBI has significantly increased in the patient population of the Department of Defense and Veterans Health Association as a result of injuries during recent military and combat operations. In the past eight years, TBI has emerged as a common form of injury in servicemen and women serving in Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Iraqi Freedom. Although penetrating traumatic brain injuries typically identified and cared for immediately, mild traumatic brain injury may be missed, particularly in the presence of other more obvious injuries. Due to numerous deployments and the nature of enemy tactics, troops are at risk for sustaining more than one mild brain injury or concussion in a short time frame. As experience with this condition in OEF and OIF service persons and veterans accumulated, it became clear that screening for possible TBI in OEF and OIF veterans could contribute to ensuring that patients are identified and treatment implemented. In response to this need, VHA established a task force including members with expertise in PM&R, neurology, psychiatry, psychology, primary care prevention, and uh, medical informatics to develop a screening tool and evaluation protocol. Following the development of a definition document, the task force constructed a screening instrument to assist in identifying OEF and OIF veterans who may be suffering from TBI, and a protocol for further evaluation and treatment of those whose screening tests are positive. Furthermore, a national electronic clinical reminder, VA TBI screening, was built incorporating this screening instrument. These protocols have been considered the seed for the development of this evidence-based practice guideline. Since we weren't sure what the best practice for these patients uh, was going to be, we looked to central office for guidance. They were very responsive and gave us great education, but it didn't seem to exactly apply to our population in New Jersey. This may in part be, have been because it was based on a model for diagnosing and managing moderate to severe TBI. We felt that it did not apply properly, hence the feeling of trying to drive a square peg in a round hole. In retrospect, the team looks back at what was not working. These issues included, number one, initially we were interpreting the neurobehavioral symptom inventory too literally. After a while, we were able to look at the symptoms and see patterns instead. Number two, we were sending too many consults to too many services when they weren't necessarily appropriate. For example, one patient may have been sent to speech pathology, social worker, OT, PT, neurology, neuropsych, pain management, and acupuncture. This reflected a multidisciplinary model of management, which was not transformed uh, into a more interdisciplinary one. We suffered from a feeling of inferiority with regard to caring for TBI. We pushed for fee basing their care to private practitioners, thinking that it would be the, in the best interest of the veteran. It became clear that the private healthcare systems did not have better or established options for these veterans, and very often they would end up at the VA after their reimbursements ran out. Many of these private institutions went to Congress saying that they were the better option for the veterans than the DOD or VA. We quickly realized that the VA was best suited to handle these veterans, and it has become a point of pride for VA New Jersey healthcare system. This may have resulted in us initially overwhelming ourselves and the veterans with our well-intentioned efforts to do too much. We were also sometimes guilty of dumping or lumping them into mental health service. We also were guilty of initially overemphasizing pathologies or labels, and there'll be more on that later. Having this hindsight allowed for self-analysis. In addition to applying a moderate to severe TBI model to mild TBI, the process may have initially been difficult for other reasons. 
it's possible that the model for managing them was more appropriate for the military uh, Department of Defense. And VA polytrauma rehabilitation centers who were seeing them really soon after injury. So for them, it is appropriate to focus on recuperation, rehabilitation, and restoration of function. Identifying and labeling pathologies are quite important during this phase, and the management is more clear-cut in the scientific literature. We are seeing, however, we were seeing veterans months to years later. The emphasis needed to be on readjustment, reassurance, and compensating for impaired function. Rather than providing shelter from the storm, we were seeing them while they were in the proverbial eye of the storm uh, as they attempted to reintegrate into society, such as school, families, spouses, children, jobs, etc. We de-emphasized pathology and problems and focused on symptoms and goals for return to function. Initially, the mandates from central office seemed unduly burdensome on the system and overwhelming for both the veteran and clinician. However, we changed our own perception of the initial evaluation day. We now see it as a reason to get their foot in the door and see the VA's face as one that cares about them. We tell them, I'm not just here for today's evaluation. I hope to be working in the VA for life, which means that you own me and I own you for a lifetime relationship. They need to see that we genuinely care about them and how committed we are to their health and recovery. If they don't experience that on the first day, their compliance will waver and then our outcomes will plummet. The first day is also a chance to document their list of symptoms, obtain diagnostic testing if needed, and fill out the neurobehavioral inventory. We in New Jersey talk of addressing the veteran's point of need, which is a common theme that will be discussed more later, and I attribute that to Dr. Shinoy. Another clarification made on day one is separation of veterans' benefits, uh, VBA, and VHA. I want the veteran to know that I am interested in their health care. Benefits are handled by another administration. It's our belief that it is important to clinically and administratively separate these two entities at each facility. Your facility's front office should be made aware that there is potential conflict of interest when one clinician is both providing care and determining benefits. We discussed this with representatives from central office. They essentially told us not to worry. They preferred overdiagnosing uh, to undertreating. Often we'll tell the veteran that the TBI eval may help with benefits, research, or new treatments down the line. Most everyone recognizes this guy. Dr. Greg House is a misanthropic medical genius who heads a team of diagnosticians in a whodunit style TV show. This detective work goes on for an hour until the end where a quick statement is made with regard to treatment. Start him on ceftriaxone and let the family know he'll be home for Kwanzaa or some such one-liner. This is what we are normally presented with in our clinics. Symptoms that require inventory, analysis, and eventually a diagnosis is made. Treatments tend to be straightforward and algorithmic. In this case, we are presented with the reverse situation. The consult says TBI positive, and we essentially have to figure out uh, figure everything out after that. Mild traumatic brain injury had a very different face in PM&R residency. We learned about mild TBI in the setting of motor vehicle accidents uh, and sports where there were cognitive issues related to a clear single event. Many times coaches were pushing us to let their athletes back in the game and so we emphasized the term brain injury over concussion. This is specifically done to promote a more aggressive management in such situations. However, our population in New Jersey was different for many reasons. Most of them were not being returned to the battlefield pending our evaluation. Also, the relevant blasts and head injuries have usually occurred months to years prior to the evaluation. Finally, multiple other comorbidities could be contributing to the current symptoms other than concussion or mild traumatic brain injury. There isn't enough evidence to say that the veteran's prior history of concussions is the cause for current neurocognitive and functional deficits. So in some cases, the presence or absence of mild TBI really doesn't matter. We're going to treat their issues anyway. The Department of Defense um, has published clinical guidance for management of mild TBI in theater and mild TBI in non-deployed medical activities. After the VA DOD working group completed the review of the evidence for this guideline, an Institute of Medicine report addressing long-term consequences of traumatic brain injury was published in 2009. The committee concluded on the basis of its evaluation that there is limited 
suggestive evidence of an association between sustaining a mild TBI resulting in loss of consciousness or amnesia and the development of unprovoked seizures, ocular and visual motor deterioration. The committee found inadequate, insufficient evidence to determine whether an association exists between mild TBI and neurocognitive deficits and long-term adverse social functioning, including unemployment, diminished social relationships, and decrease in the ability to live independently. For long-term outcomes, the IOM report describes limited suggestive evidence of an association between mild TBI and Parkinson's disorder and between mild TBI and dementia of the Alzheimer's type, when the injury included loss of consciousness. However, insufficient evidence of such association was found in mild TBI without loss of consciousness. We were very uncomfortable with the idea of labeling veterans as TBI in this setting. We had to come to terms with the fact that the evaluation was a good thing to do and useful for many reasons beyond just the TBI designation. In order to feel more comfortable with the evaluation process, we decided to call it an exposure to events that may have caused concussion or traumatic brain injury. For example, many healthcare workers are PPD positive, meaning that they have been exposed to tuberculosis or TB. However, this is not equivalent to having active TB, which requires aggressive treatment. We've noticed that many clinicians in the nation have adopted this language as well. We think it's in the veteran's best interest to think of it this way as well so that they don't perseverate on the pathology which cannot be confirmed objectively anyway. Another measure that has helped us to physic uh, helped us is to physically separate the documentation of mild traumatic brain injury exposure from the rest of the assessment. We are also meticulously detailed about the reasons for why the veteran is deemed positive or negative. Finally, our verbiage is specifically chosen to de-emphasize pathology. This section is easily found by anyone reviewing the chart in no uncertain terms in our consult. Although we fill out the second level evaluation, we also answer the generated consult in a format that feels more comfortable to us. Feel free to take this text and use it in your own documentation. Compliments of the New Jersey PM&R team. The designation of TBI positive or negative is not always so straightforward. Also, the typical features of mild traumatic brain injury are not always manifested in our veterans. Although these are some clear, uh, th although there are some clear differences, many of our veterans seem normal until challenged by increasing cognitive demands of work or school. So sometimes our physiatrists can use some help. Enter our neuropsychologist, Dr. Larry Weinberger, uh, who has now retired, uh, but at that time he went through the evolution with us while he was employed by mental health and behavioral sciences. Clearly there's a large component and connection between mental health issues and mental health management and rehabilitation in this population. There's a well-established contribution by PTSD which uh, may have been masking, masquerading, or exacerbating TBI symptoms. In our service, neuropsychology has been important in identifying which of these situations applies to the individual veteran. Our approach may have been different because we realize that the physiatrist is limited in ability to do cognitive evaluations. Other institutions did not go in that direction. In our meetings, uh, the physiatrists realized very early on that there are patterns of symptoms in these returning veterans after combat or deployment. They all seem to present with a constellation of symptoms cognitive impairments, affective disorders such as anxiety or depression, axial neck or back pain without a radicular component, um, knee pain, specifically patellofemoral, headaches, sleep disorders, delayed presentation, usually months or years after returning. Perhaps this is some syndrome that has yet to be described or discovered. Maybe there is some exposure, infectious, toxic, environmental, that can explain this consistent set of symptoms. Perhaps this is some kind of new syndrome. Uh, we in New Jersey are not unique in this thought. Other different syndromes and names are floating around. Uh, naming it is not good, uh, is not a good idea, although behind closed doors we refer to it as CRAS, Combat Re Related Adjustment Syndrome. So here is an e excellent example of a typical uh, returning veteran who we see for a second level evaluation. This is the final section of the answered consult. Notice that the mild TBI exposure is clearly described and in the priority list, 
is bulleted in order of the veteran's choosing. This is usually copied and pasted into the background section of the follow-up note, and we go through each bullet with the veteran. Feel free to covet this, compliments of New Jersey. A few years ago, we were told by central office academics that two interventions had evidence to support any meaningful benefit for these veterans. They were case management and psychoeducation. The New Jersey physiatrist sat down one day to compare notes, and we realized we were essentially all saying the same things. We take at least 10 minutes to compassionately deliver these messages. One, we have documented that you've been exposed to a concussion so that you may reap the benefits of service connection, research, or treatment in the future as needed. However, you should not leave here believing you have permanent brain damage. Number two, the effects of concussion usually don't persist after six months, but if there's any chance that it does, you should do whatever you can to promote healing. This includes optimizing your nutrition, exercise, and sleep. Three, even though it seems like an inconvenience at this time, you should really address your mental health issues now. It's especially likely that veterans applying for jobs in law enforcement would deny this because they're afraid it'll affect their chance at employment. We tell them that it's likely to come up in a maladaptive way later and is better addressed today. They should be reminded that there are non-medical interventions that will not show up in their medical record. Number four, you're going to be doing the heavy lifting, but we're here to help you through this. It's going to take time and patience, but you're going to get better. Number five, make sure to keep in touch with your case manager. She or he is very good at negotiating the VA healthcare system and expediting things for you. And I usually walk them to their case manager if they haven't already met. And number six, finally, I'm here for you for life. We're going to be seeing each other over the years as your issues evolve. Don't hesitate to call me when in doubt. So we decided to document this in our uh, consultation to remind our residents that this is a crucial checklist. Feel free to copy and paste this into your own templates as needed. Compliments of VA New Jersey PMNRS. After the evaluation, it's time to get moving on treatment. The traditional treatments of mild traumatic brain injury may not apply so well to our veterans. They deserve a program to return them to a high level of functioning that is task or occupation or school specific. Our focus is on developing these aspects with an emphasis on vocational functioning. Yippee! Hurrah! VA New Jersey Healthcare System, Department of PMNR has some of the finest residents in the country. But on day one of residency, we usually have to start with an approach to therapy prescription that is new to them. Many of them seem to have their treatments in mind before they construct their goals. PMNR starts by establishing the goals first and then using the tricks in your bag of tricks to achieve these goals. So what is the goal for these veterans? As one speech pathologist said to me, it is to make these veterans successful, productive members of society. This is a very difficult goal to achieve in some cases. As a speech pathologist continued, I'm not going to be able to fix them. Therefore, the emphasis has to be on compensatory strategies. Sometimes these are not listed in any textbooks or instruction manuals. So it takes creative thinking, patience, trial and error, and of course, resources to establish successful interventions for the future. Polytrauma outpatient rehabilitation is all about community reintegration. This stuff is not really found in any uh, books or manuals. If you're a supervisor, encourage and permit your clinicians to be creative, take chances, and try things that are outside the box. Work hard to get a case manager on your team. If you can get a functionally oriented neuropsychologist, we recommend it. Our advice is to focus on goals rather than the problems. This requires time with the veteran, whether it's in the room, on the phone, or at their home or workplace. We are working on telehealth and other strategies to get the maximum number of clinicians to the veteran in at one time. And this was again 2010, so uh, telehealth is here since the pandemic and here to stay. Although we initially set our goals quite high, many of us realize that we have to set realistic expectations. Some issues may contribute to more difficulty with new learning. Demographics play a large part. For example, if they were poor performers prior to the injury, not all high school degrees are equal. For example, one speech therapist remembers a veteran who wanted to become a postal worker. Although he was a high school graduate, he was in all remedial classes and just barely got by. He needed to be taught memorization for the first time, as opposed to spending hours looking at books. 
Foreigners and non-native speakers of American English may have more difficulty with the speech assessments and rehab. They may have had to make very few decisions until now. Renee Kaufman, uh, our speech pathologist at that time, said, for example, mom took care of everything, then the army took care of everything, and now, all of a sudden, the veteran expects that he is just going to be able to immediately handle all of the financial and college-related decisions. Someone came up with a count of the average number of decisions the average adult male civilian makes in a day versus the average number of decisions that a serviceman, specifically at the grunt level, makes. The difference is huge. We all make virtually thousands of decisions every day from how much toothpaste to put on the toothbrush to what we do at work. Our young vets who go straight into the service from high school are on their own when they come out. They're not accustomed to making many important day-to-day -day decisions or managing their own schedule. It is part of the equation when we get them for therapy. As kids and in high school, uh, they have routines that are preset, usually mom, takes care of meals, laundry, clothing, medical appointments, etc. Parents and teachers and coaches are there to remind them of what to do and when to do it. School curriculum and a lot of uh, extracurricular activities are programmed. They go into the military and practically every decision, from what time they get up to what underwear they put on, to what they eat and what they'll do for the day, is programmed. There's limited decision making. They're trained to react more than act in many situations during the day. They leave the service and are on their own. And suddenly, they have to do it all for themselves. And it, and it is not formulaic. Uh, that was uh, Renee Kaufman. Uh, Dr. Weinberger, a neuropsychologist, he said, one key issue seems to be that individuals who, have, uh, who are somewhat older uh, are better educated, re have reasonable family support, and or have better developmental histories, report better adaptations post-deployment and injury. While this may be a self-evident bias, it's been my clinical experience that these patients also try to move on with their lives, despite their injuries, more than 20 to 22 year old folks, and more concretely, they often report adopting cognitive compensatory strategies spontaneously. Having learned how to learn in the past probably generalizes. In contrast with the academically weak individuals who have never incorporated systematic learning strategies and have to be taught the basics of organization plus self-discipline. It's time to talk about the difference between multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary care. A healthcare discipline is an area of knowledge and research that is critical to patient care. In multidisciplinary practice, each member of a clinical group practices with an awareness and tolerance of other disciplines. In interdisciplinary practice, members of a team actively coordinate care across disciplines. In an ideal interdisciplinary healthcare team, decisions are made by consensus and each discipline has an equal opportunity for input into decisions. To make the transition from multidisciplinary to interdisciplinary practice, all disciplines, rather than representing freestanding silos, must have shared borders that represent a common professional interest and knowledge base. Such a practice model will lead to an increased level of trust among professions and a deeper level of understanding about what each profession can contribute. Barriers to interdisciplinary practice include historical factors such as different philosophies of practice and professional training, logistics of team implementation, and resource limitation. Interdisciplinary care must be applied in a cost-effective way. Interdisciplinary patient care must be taught in professional schools and postgraduate training programs. Interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary patient care requires a common values, a common vision, and an understanding of teamwork with the ultimate goal of serving the patient with wisdom. And uh, this came from uh, Dr. Uh, Ray in the American Journal of Health System Pharmacy, Volume 55, Issue 13, page 1369, uh, 1998. And I have another reference, which is Interdisciplinary Teams in Healthcare and Human Service set Settings, um, Health and Social Work, Volume 24, 1999, by Rose Rosalie Faulkner Schofield. And Inter interdisciplinary teams in healthcare and human services settings, are they effective? This was uh, Health uh, S Social Work, 1999, August 24, Volume 3, page 210. 
So PM&R and VA New Jersey Healthcare System decided to put the VA's money where our mouth was uh, and pushed hard to hire more team members with the support of central office. This required letters to the administration, uh, meetings with our front office, analysis of the statistics, and active recruitment process. What we are doing is more transitional rehabilitation than acute rehabilitation. This harkens back to the slide that compares the DOD to the VA. We're looking at their long-term disability and community reintegration. Transitional rehabilitation requires case management. VA New Jersey uh, success is mostly due to our aggressive case management team headed by, at that time, Michelle Stefanelli. Uh, June Mayer at that time was our nurse practitioner. She filled in the gaps and acted as a liaison to other specialty, specialties uh, when it was outside the realm of the physiatrist. Robin reached out into the community and pulled in any veteran uh, she could in colleges and other organizations. Fran was like an automatic machine gun. She made hundreds of phone calls to ensure that the veteran will come to their appointments. The no-share rate would be significantly higher without her. And the rest of the team is equally important in maintaining close contact with those that we were afraid would fall out of the system. OEF, OIF team has gone to the debriefing centers and get them registered. Active duty to veteran status. So our team became a national model for excellence in case management. These slides were presented with permission from Michelle Stefanelli. Um, uh, uh, and it was about the OEF, OIF program and transition unit at New Jersey. And I'm just going to click through them. I don't believe that what New Jersey is experiencing is out of the ordinary. We're probably all converging on a common feeling or thought as we develop more experiences with this population of veterans. We're still evolving in New Jersey. One thing that we tried but did not succeed at is structured programs for cognitive rehabilitation. Our population of veterans don't really seem to want group-based day programs. We found more success with individualized goal-directed therapies. We plan to focus on high level function, including uh, activity on sports specific training, job skills and coaching. This was a slide just showing that we were offering uh, a lot of also musculoskeletal procedures and we were the first PM&R service to be performing ultrasound guided injections in the Vizin. So if we had to provide a recipe for what worked for us, it would be this. When the central office volunteered me to do this presentation, these were the goals they presented. I hope my presentation provided you with material to support these goals. When in doubt, as this confused veteran is sitting in front of you, and you yourself are just as confused about what to do, sometimes the best thing is to reach deep down into your own heart and pull out the compassion that initially compelled you to serve the veterans. It's in these challenging moments that we find the creativity, strength, and compassion to do what is needed. Feel free to com comment or compliment uh, by contacting uh, me. Uh, I am no longer in the VA, uh, but you can uh, speak to my comrade Nigel.Shenoy, S-H-E-N-O-Y, at VA.gov. Uh, and none of this would have been possible without our very, very supportive chief, Dr. Che M. Che dot M, C -H -A -E, dot im at va.gov. Thank you very much for your time and attention.